Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 16, 2015, and this is the week in charts. Well, I'm out of Mountain Dew, so I keep forgetting to go to the store or put it on the to-do list. But um, So I guess I won't get jacked up this week. I got a lot to cover, though. I should be able to cover it all without being jacked up on the Dew. There's a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up really quickly. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and and then we got a lot of new faces today, so I want to welcome everybody to the show. Appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to give it a shot. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, I lecture a little bit about the markets, and sometimes that can go on a little bit. Um, I lecture a little bit about trading, and sometimes that goes into a rant or two, which is uh, which is okay because sometimes we we'll, we'll, we get some good stuff uh, that comes out from that. Um, if you don't mind uh, doing the slides, let's keep questions uh, on the slides. Uh, but you could also ask questions on trading in general, and if we have time, we'll get to that. Uh, also, when we get to the, to the actual charts, if you're interested in knowing what uh, my two cents is on a stock, just ask about stocks one at a time and hit carriage return. You can ask about a dozen stocks. That, that would be great if you did. But uh, after you ask about a stock hit enter on your computer i call it carriage return shows you how long i've been around this earth anyway uh so what are we going to talk about well first of all uh in my column a couple of days ago i wrote about how to to kind of boil things down and it's as easy as one two three and then four five and that'll make a lot more sense in just one second um and this kind of got me thinking quite a bit about why you must plan your trade. So instead of me telling you what I'm going to tell you, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Okay. This is what I wrote a couple days ago. I gave it up trying to predict the markets many years ago. I've since learned to just follow along. This means seeking to identify an established or emerging trend and then looking for a place to get on board. An entry helps to guarantee that the trend is resuming, at least at that moment. No trigger, no trade. That in of itself will keep you out of a lot of soon-to-be-doomed trades. Once triggered, a protective stop will take you out just in case you fail miserably. And trust me, quite often you will. The good news is that you will be wrong less and less, and you will learn to pick the best, which I have a 14-hour course on, FYI. You'll be wrong less and less, and you'll... Just as you just follow along and avoid the paralysis that comes with too much analysis. No matter how well thought, every trade has the potential to work or not. And as I often say, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Again, just choose your battles carefully to begin with. If things do begin to materialize, an additional protective target, initial profit target, sorry, helps to ensure you get a piece just in case it stops working. If the trend does persist, the trailing stop on the remaining will keep you in. Now, that's a lot in just one little paragraph, kind of all jammed together. But if we break it down and take a look at it, it's going to make a lot more sense. In fact, let's go back and forth to a chart as we do. What I did was I took a, a recent trade that worked, but it wasn't stellar, okay? But it's much better than a poke in the eye. In fact, that's what I call these type of trades. So number one, I've given up trying to predict the markets years ago. I've since learned to just follow along. This means seeking to identify an established or an emerging trend and then looking for a place to get on board. So let's take a look at that. This is a recent trade that came straight out of my trading service. In fact, let's see if it's even in here. Oopsies. You know, give me one second. Um, I'll have to get the, um, let's get the slide in here. I guess we'll have to edit this out. Let's see, we got, um, Okay, anyway, I want to show you a snap of the port, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that in just one second. So getting back to the chart, I wanted to show you where it came from. 
but um, I'll get to that towards the end. So this is where it came from. If you look at the spreadsheet, which I was trying to load here and failed miserably, this was the actual trade that came out. Okay. Now, the first thing is that you wanted an established trend or emerging trend. Now, an emerging trend is when something bottoms out and begins to rally like this, or obviously rolls over, begins to implode. So the trend is changing. These patterns are a little bit more complex than the trend resumption type of patterns. So ideally, you want to, at least when you're learning, you want to focus more on the established trends. In this particular case, it also happens to be accelerating, which is something else that I like to look for. And persistency is very important. Persistency means, means that the stock tends to go up day after day after day after day. It tends to trade in kind of an orderly fashion when it goes up. And then notice when it goes down, it kind of just pulls back kind of orderly in here. So number one, we've identified a established trend. So number two, an entry helps to guarantee that the trend is resuming at least at that moment. No trigger, no trade. That in and of itself will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Now, in an ideal world, a stock triggers and it doesn't look back. In this particular case, it, it triggered and it came right back in. So I was thinking, uh-oh, this doesn't look good, but let's just follow the plan, which we're going to talk a lot about in just one second. Now, a textbook entry would be right above this little point. And by the way, I guess one needs to be like one and one A. One A is like you also need a setup once you have the, uh, once you have established the trend. So here we have what I call a trend knockout, which means that you've got some bars headed higher and then you have this one big bar like this, which knocks out a few bars. And that, as I've said quite a bit, that helps to take out some players, some of the fast money. It also, help, it also helps to attract some eager shorts into the trade. Now, I should say into the market. Once those players are in the market, when or if that trend begins to resume, it begins to shake out these players. Now, a textbook entry, you'd put it right above this high. But the reason we don't do that, or we don't often do that, some particular setups will lend themselves to that. But the reason that we don't often do that is just in case somebody tries to manipulate the market. Yes, it does happen to push it higher, to trigger people in, and then take it right back down. So by having that entry above the market, it helps to avoid it. So here's an actual second example here. And I wanted to use this one a couple of weeks ago, but I forgot to show it. But here's where this stock actually set up again, and I actually re-recommended it, and the entry was right around here. And notice that a textbook entry would have, would have triggered you in and spit you out, okay? But by using a slightly more liberal entry, instead of entering right here, we put it up here. And what happens? The market rallies up, and then it comes right back in. To those who are new to these presentations, sometimes I use the word market and stock interchangeably. Okay. Now, so we've got an entry, and it says once triggered, a protective stop will take you out just in case you fail miserably. And obviously, you will often. Okay. And you have to get used to that. Okay. But as you get better and better with your stock picking, looking for that persistency, looking for that acceleration of trend, of course, a setup, and the ability for the stock to trade cleanly, and everything else I discussed in the 14 hours that we spent in the course of stock selection, then you're ahead of the game. The money management will tend to take care of itself because your best defense is often a good offense and I know it's cliche but you want to pick the best and leave the rest okay so no matter how great the setup looks we decide that we better put a stop in just in case and you can see that it did rally up came back in but fortunately it didn't stop us out and it had a couple of fits and starts now there are some out there or I should say there are many out there that aren't patient enough to see a trade through. And that's very unfortunate 
because they quit at the first signs of adversity. It causes them to make too many decisions, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. And it just creates the stress. And it, it creates a bit of a, a feedback loop where it just creates more and more stress. Whereas if you just stick with the trade, good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to get some bad. You're going to get some indifferent. But you're also going to get some good. You're going to reap the fruits of your labor. And that's why I often do what I call the dead money report. Everyone is very impatient. They get in the trade, let's say the little trade triggers. Okay. And then it does this. Well, most people will bail out because they lose patience. And this is what I call the dead money report. And I'll do one of these every now and then. In fact, hopefully I'll be doing one over the next couple of weeks because we've got a couple of positions in the portfolio that have just kind of sidelined for a while. And they're not making they're not making much progress. They're not going down too much, but they're not making much forward progress as of late. And hopefully, you hate to use the word hope, but hopefully over the next week or two, they're going to break out again and give me yet another what I call the so-called dead money report. Dead money, people think, oh, well, this stock is not going higher. Once I'm in it, I should just immediately get out. No, what you should do is follow your plan. Now, it all comes back. This is what I keep coming back to over and over again. When I started working on this psychology course, which I've been working on for about a month or so, and it's probably going to take me a year to develop it because it's so it's so massive. It's going to be probably more massive than, than stock selection, where stock selection is just kind of almost a mechanical type of process the way I do it. The psychology is going to be a lot more, again, massive and a little bit more, not too esoteric, but a little bit further out there. So the problem is that many people, when they, they get into this, this situation where the market's just going sideways, they tend to bail out. But if, first of all, getting back to the stock selection, I don't want to digress too far. If you're the best stocks to begin with, then you just follow your plan. And, and where I'm going with the psychology talk is that I work on the psychology for a while, and then it brings me back to, but first of all, you really need a good methodology. Then it becomes kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. You have to have a really good methodology. You have to go out and trade it to see how you're going to react from a psychological standpoint. And then you have to improve and improve and improve upon that methodology until you think you have something that's, number one, viable, and number two, that you could follow from a psychological standpoint. So it, it keeps coming back to proper stock selection and proper market selection and also, on top of that, a, a viable methodology. Once you get into the trade, provided you did all these things, then you just have a stop in place and you honor that stop. And you stick with the trade, good, bad, or indifferent. Again, if you exit at the first signs of adversity, and let's just take a look at this trade. Let's pick it apart. Okay, day one, you're underwater. Day two, you're underwater. Day three, day four, day five, day six. So that's a week and a day because these are trading days, right? So if you'd have given up any time during this period, you would have locked in a sure loss. And then on day seven, what happens? You're back to profitability. Well, you're feeling pretty good. Day eight, day nine, hey, I'm making money on this trade. Day 10, bam, you get whacked. So you're two weeks into the trade, and now you're underwater. Day 11, you're getting whacked even more. So then you decide, well, I'm going to bail out. Day 12, what happens? Bam, back to profitability. And not too bad. Nicely in the plus column, okay? And then, of course, day 13, day 14, it really begins to take off. And then on day 15, you're up here banging out the initial profit targets. OK. Now. So if things begin to materialize. You do two things. You have an initial profit target to help ensure and then you have I'm sorry to help ensure that you get a piece of the trade. And then you have a trailing stop to hopefully keep you in that market for a long, long time. So let's break that down. So you can see as this position begins moving in our favor right here, we begin to trail that stop higher, okay? 
and we take that initial profit target out, meaning that in this particular case we had uh, we were looking for three points, okay, and then so when this stock hits 14, we're taking half of those shares off the table, and then if we're not already close to break even, we move up that stop to break even. A trailing stop and if we get stopped out we get stopped out okay so I thought it'd be good to show you this example I wanted to show you this example last week as a, a um, we just ran out of time but uh, waiting for entries and how important waiting for entries is and using somewhat of a liberal entry again not to beat the dead horse but having the entry up here instead of down here in a textbook fashion saves you from a losing trade well that makes a big deal Every time you miss a losing trade, that's hard to quantify because it's kind of a, an abstract thing. But if you would have actually triggered into that trade and then lost money, now you not only have to have a winning trade to cover that, but it's got to be enough to cover that. And then you're just going to get back to break even in covering that. And hopefully that trade has to go or that trade, I should say, will have to go even further to get you back into black so the further you're on the hole the harder it is to get out as you know with drawdown if you lose 10 percent of your money you have to make back 11.1 percent on the next trade or the subsequent trades okay if you lose half of your money if you lose 50 percent then obviously you have to make back 100 percent to get back to break even so avoiding as many losing trades as possible really makes a big difference in the portfolio, okay? So pick the best to begin with. Once you pick them, then just make your plan and follow your plan. And if things work out, great. If they don't, as sometimes they won't, then so what, okay? Now, one thing I want to talk about now, and this was, uh, I left this in from last week. We were talking about how there's times to do things and it's time to be patient when it comes to the market. And that's why I'm always talking about the dead money report. In fact, if you go back into YouTubes that I have posted, you'll see that I've used this stock quite often because it makes such great examples. Because like right here, this is a dead money report. This is a dead money report, okay, where nothing really happened. But the point I wanted to leave this slide in for, the reason I left this slide in, I should say, is that you really need to obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. And then once you're in it, it's just two, three, four, five, those things we just talked about. You just follow along. Now let's let's divert for a minute before we come back to the markets. Okay, what ice cream would you like? Now don't answer just yet. But we have strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate and I know you're probably thinking yes please as I was <laughs> when I put these slides together but I want you to think you can only have one and I want you to think about that okay now if you made your decision think about that or would you prefer Oreo and cake ice cream that sounds pretty good or wild and reckless sherbet? What about world-class chocolate ice cream? Or s'more the merrier? What about pistachio almond? Or mint chocolate chip? Greek sunset frozen yogurt? Watermelon splash ice? Icing on the cake ice cream? Or fireworks, fun ice cream. How about pink bubblegum ice cream? Peanut butter and chocolate. Peanut butter and banana. Lunar cheesecake. Lemon custard. Nutty coconut. Jamocha. Triple grape. Oreo cookies and cream, rum raisin, premium 
chunky, reduced fat, no sugar, added pineapple, coconut, cream, cheese. Splish Splash. Reese's Peanut Butter. Reese's Peanut Butter. Reese's Peanut Butter. Easy for me to say. A cup. Mom's Making Cookies. Made with Snickers. Ice Cream. Red Velvet. Rainbow Sherbet. Raspberry Sinclair? Sensit? No, ran Raspberry. Oh, Raspberry Sensi Tea Ice Cream. Heath Bar. Salty Caramel. Pralines of Cream. Rocky Road. Gold Medal Ribbon. Old Fashioned. Butter pecan, something almond fudge, almond fudge, or maybe one of these. These are some of the other flavors that are offered. These are Baskin Robbins ice creams, chocolate chip cookie dough, chocolate chip ice cream, chocolate fudge, chocolate mousse. Chocolate, I guess we already used that one, so this one's no longer a choice if you change your mind. Cotton candy, fat free yogurt, frozen yogurt, daiquiri ice, and another some kind of cheesecake ice cream. So where am I going with this? Too many choices. All right, good. Ah, you're on to me. All right. So you guys, you're, you're one step ahead. Okay, we got the point. You're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, I, 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 there was actually, I reached the point where I'm like, good Lord, how many how many flavors are there? And I just took these straight from the Baskin-Robbins website. So when you have too many choices, you end up with this analysis paralysis and the associated stress when the number of decisions increases, the so-called paradox of choice. Now, there's a book. Um, I ordered it right before the presentation. I haven't read it yet. But from the summary, it looks like it just basically says that the more decisions you have, the harder it is to make a decision. And then um, I've been doing a little reading from um, from Montier, Montier and uh, Gilovich, Gilovich. And they, they talk about these things, too, where if you have fewer decisions – it's much easier to make a decision or fewer decisions to make, fewer choices than if you have a lot of them. So I'm doing a little studying on all this. And then uh, the genesis of the ice cream thing, we talked about that a few weeks ago briefly, was uh, a, an episode of, of Brain Games where they talked about the, the, the making the choices. I'm in here working on my psychology presentation and watching the markets and I go in the house to – to get a glass of water or whatever. My daughter's in there watching brain games, and it's like, wow, it's, this is this is good stuff here on on how the brain works and how these choices work. So this kind of dovetails into why you must plan your trade and trade your plan. If you have a plan going in and you know what your decisions are going to be, one, two, three, four, five, you've got everything mapped out, then all you have to do is follow your plan. I know, easier said than done. But what happens is you start this mental gymnastics where it's like it, this is the dead money, this is the losing money on a trade. So as soon as you start losing money on the trade or as soon as that trade just kind of goes sideways to where you're certainly not making any money, these mental gymnastics begin to start. Like, well, should I get out? Should I not get out? You start putting yourself through all the stress of all these choices. You have no control over what's going to happen after you enter a trade. So before you enter that trade, make sure you know what you're going to do. Have that plan done ahead of time and follow the plan. I know easier said than done, but the point is that the more choices you give yourself, the more stress you're going to end up with, and you might even end up not making any choice because when it comes too overwhelming, you just kind of shut down. And in that particular case, what might happen is you might end up with a position that stops out and you're not doing anything because you're trying to, to, to fix the trade, so to speak. I'm not talking about a little discretion where you 
say, okay, well, I'll nick the stop. I'm going to stick with it because this is part of my plan. I'm talking about it blows through your stop and it keeps on going and it keeps on going. And you're like, well, maybe I'll get out. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll wait a little longer. Maybe it'll come back. You start doing all these mental gymnastics again, and that begins to take its toll on you. And then, I don't want to go too far in this, but that could actually, you could actually end up what's called a sunk cost where you've, you've already, you've already lost so much money. What difference does it make if you lose a little more? Okay. The problem with that is, is that even a very small trade, like a 2% trade, like when I'm punching in numbers in my spreadsheet and if I fat finger a number on a trade and add in an extra zero or don't add in an extra digit, that one trade, okay, that one botch trade could put a serious dent and have a horrible impact on the entire portfolio. So just those little mistakes when I'm punching everything in makes me realize how important it is to have a stop and, again, to have the mentality, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And to, more importantly, not only have that stop, but follow your plan, and if you get taken out, you get taken out. Now, Montier also said that emotions tend to change when – over it's tend to take over i'm sorry when information is uncertain certain or changing so information is going to be changing as soon as the market opens so if you're planning your trade outside of normal market hours we're not going to trade in after hours trading we're not going to even worry about that okay so for all intents and purposes the market is closed i don't look at after hours trading when i'm planning my trades and everything else because i don't want to confuse things further so you need to do your planning while things are still static okay and tyson said it the best everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face so you have your plan everything's done and then you get into the market so that all of a sudden starts going against you and then you start thinking about again these mental gymnastics i think that's the word of the the they, that's a nicer way. I was, I've been working for about a week to try to find out a nicer way of saying uh, – there's a, there's a less nice way of saying it, mental, uh, but let's keep it PG-13. So it's, while things are static, it's much easier to make that plan. I like to have a big cup of coffee. I look at a lot of charts. I plan out my day ahead of time, and then all I have to do – I know, haha – is follow that plan. And the more you follow the plan, your life gets easier and easier. And if you do freeze, as I said a second ago, the less likely you will be to even make a decision. And then there's that kind of negative feedback loop that comes with that. And that's why I occasionally, occasionally get emails from people, Dave, I'm down 50 bucks in this stock. You know, well, what was your plan? Well, my plan was to get out at three bucks loss or five bucks loss, whatever the case was, but now I'm down 50. Because they were down five and they didn't get out. This is, well, maybe it'll come back. Then they were down six. Then they were down seven. And it just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And they just they just kept holding on because now they got such big a loss. If they take it, they would look like an idiot, right? Well, you already have the loss on your books, okay? It's a real loss. It's real money that has been lost. As I said, I think in layman's or even maybe even before layman's, um, I said, you can't go to the bank with a portfolio of stocks that have been beaten up. Let's say in 2009, you rode the market down like a lot of stupid people did instead of following the trend, right? You get out and you're short or you just sit on your hands when the market begins to roll over. But you couldn't go, you can't go to the bank with those stocks that are down 50%, at least in March of 2009, and say, Hey, uh, these stocks are really – I know this says $50,000, but they're really worth $100,000, okay, without the benefit of any um, hindsight or foresight or whatever, without knowing that obviously the market did bottom. But the banker certainly isn't going to loan you $100,000 money on that collateral if, if you're putting up that as collateral. So it's a real loss, and but psychologically, it's very hard for many to take that loss because – They've already lost so much. Well, it's always darkest right before light, but it's also always darkest before it gets more dark. So you have to very, you have to make sure you have a really good defense 
in place. And then again, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Make sure you really, really like the trade. So you're looking at something's like, okay, uh, this thing's accelerating higher. We've got a nice little knockout move. It looks pretty good. It's persistency. It tends to, it persists. It tends to go up day after day after day. I think I'm going to take the trade. Okay. Once you trigger in the trade, then the thinking stops. You just need to trade your plan. You just need to honor your stop. You need to take partial profits if blessed with them. And then you need to trail your stop as long as the trend moves in your favor. And that's it. Okay. All right. Frenchie says a number of – Frenchie says there is never too many choices. You just have to pick one. Uh, okay. Uh, the number of choices expand your creativity. Right, but – when it comes to trading, that could be a recipe for disaster. You have to limit the amount of choices you're going to make once you're in a trade, okay? Decide on all those choices ahead of time, and you must limit those choices because if you come in and you wing it, which most people do, and I've, I've put a lot of thought into why most people wing it. The reason they wing it is the moment you make a plan, which includes a protective stop, is the same moment that you admit that you might be wrong on that trade. But if you're just winging it, you don't have to admit that you might be wrong, okay? And then as more and more decisions come in, the stress begins to mount as the aforementioned psychologists have talked about and then it just becomes a negative feedback loop none of the above fish food p f i s h yeah i started i started looking at that's those uh, stoners ice cream and i started looking to those guys cuz they've got so many weird flavors um but i figured we'd just stick with basket robins cuz they're only supposed to be like 30 something 33 flavors at basket robins you're getting diabetes. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I, I started to say, I started to say, okay, provided that you don't have diabetes or you're on your way to diabetes, yes, or you're not a fat bastard like me and you can have some ice cream. 57. Baskin Robbins has 57 flavors? Or does uh, Ben & Jerry's? Okay, too many choices, hard to decide. Agree. Okay, that's, that's the whole point. Too many choices, hard to decide. So limit the, your amount of choices going in to – the trade. Know where you're going to get in. Know where you're going to place your stop. Know how you're going to trail your stop. And know where you're going to take those initial profits. If you're a little bit more experienced, then obviously you could have a couple little discretionary things you could do. But even that needs to be kind of chosen ahead of time. Okay. So I know that if I come into a market and I get whacked 10 points on a stock overnight, I know that, okay. Don't freak out, Dave. This really sucks, okay? But I know that there's a chance that it might be like a, a reversal that the market maker or the powers that be might have taken it down because of the bad news, and maybe everybody jumped out at the same time. And I know that if I could hold on just a little bit longer, then I might catch an opening gap reversal and be able to mitigate the damage that's already done. But I also know that my plan is going to be that if it keeps on dropping, then I must have to get out and lick my wounds. Okay. So, but knowing that ahead of time, it makes it much easier to act. So that decision has already been made. So make as many decisions. Okay. So you don't have to have more and more choices when you come into the market. Okay. All right, lots of flavors of ice cream. Yes. Okay, uh, any questions on anything so far? Any questions on trading in general before we hop out into the charts? Um, I'm still running a $7 special on my uh, trading service. So if you're interested in that, if you go to the website under products, under core trading service, 
you'll see that there. And let me see if I could find that. Uh, what else is going on? Okay. All right, let's go. Let me go ahead and get the chart set up here. And we can come back to anything that you, um, anything we talked about. Okay, here's the, uh, let me just show you this real quick. Is this right? I have one more in here. Nope. I took a snapshot right before the presentation. I went back a uh, time a little bit, and I want to show you the original trade and the original portfolio, but it didn't, um, it, it tends to, it got lost in the, um, shuffle somehow so let's just hop out to the markets but you saw that the original trade i actually had the the original plan was on that uh slide itself i wanted to show you the whole portfolio but that didn't take let's uh let's go to the overall market first and if you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks feel free to start now and as soon as i get through the market and some sectors um we'll take a look at that first of all let's start with the s p 500 uh, today, obviously, a good day. Let's start with the micro and work our way out. Uh, yesterday, I was a little concerned because it sort of was uh, stalling out a little bit, even though it was just kind of a flat day. It was stalling out a little bit, and this is kind of uh, similar to um, to the gatekeeper type of pattern, but it's a little bit more pronounced in the Russell 2000, which we'll take a look at in just one second. Let's put the 200-day moving average in. One thing that I like to... to do is when a market is at or near new highs and if it's above its 200 day moving average which those two will always be the same if it's at or near new highs it's it's good to get a little perspective of the overall market now we had a sell signal back here up here so just because it's above the 200 day moving average doesn't mean you want to stay long but if a market is kind of getting a little confusing and you're not sure whether it's headed up or down you want to err on the side of the longer term trend you can see right here we had daylight meaning the lows are greater than the moving average for a long long time for a year and change and then for the next year or so we had daylight once again we had a little kiss of the moving average recently and fortunately it bounced right off now it won't always bounce off of that moving average sooner or later it'll take it out and head lower but as long as it's at or near new highs, then you want to, again, you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. Now with today's, let's say we close where we are now, we're less than a half a percent away from all time highs. So, so far so good. Unfortunately, in the S&Ps, we've gone sideways for quite a long time. Now, one thing that I'm seeing recently over the last week or so, maybe a little bit longer, is that I'm not really seeing any new setups just yet. But as you're going to see in just a second, some sectors are looking pretty good, so we could see some soon. So recently I haven't seen a whole lot of setups, but for some reason, and, and I found it kind of odd, even though the market is going mostly sideways, we've had quite a few setups so far this year, and so far it's been a pretty good year in spite of the market going sideways. Had you showed me this picture of the market in May I said well I wouldn't have I wouldn't have traded for the last six seven months but the setups were there right now we're not seeing the setups which is perfectly normal the market looked like it was rolling over now it's coming back strong so it's going to take a little while for everything to kind of reset itself also if you're trading a pullback methodology the market's doing this you're not going to get any pullbacks we're getting a few shorts now because the market sold off and this rally now could be seen as a pullback and some individual issues okay so we have to be patient and we have to wait. We talked a lot about being patient in last week's presentation. Now let's take a look at this NASDAQ. And this is why you don't rush out and sell the form every time something gets just a little bit iffy. Because as a trend follower, you never know whether they're just trying to shake you out 
okay? Or it could be the beginning of a new trend in the opposite direction. Is it a bona fide top? You won't know until after the fact. So instead of rushing and making that extra decision, giving yourself one more choice and bailing out every time things get iffy, you just continue to follow the plan and follow along. And longer term, that's the thing to do. You're never going to catch a big longer term winner if you quit every time the market looks a little iffy. Yes, sooner or later, as I said last week, in hindsight, you're going to want to kick yourself and say, oh, man, I should have got out of all these stocks. I knew the market was rolling over. Well, that will happen sooner or later. But as long as that market's in a longer term trend, more often than not, the longer term trend is going to resume and then you're going to be left without any positions and now you're buying at even higher and higher prices trying to get in and maybe that time the market does roll over so you're just going to create all this stress and anxiety for yourself by trying to make too many decisions as opposed to just following that plan so this nasdaq is roaring back with a vengeance and we could easily see new highs today we're what a tenth of a percent away, round numbers, away from all-time highs in the NASDAQ. So, so far, so good there. Now, I'm not a big fan of these V-shaped recoveries because by the time you get all the way back to the old highs, the market is already overbought. But let's not look into it too much. Let's wait until we get setups. If this market can break out, and yeah, it's going to probably correct at some point, even if it does break out, then maybe we'll get some setups and we'll take those setups if the trend continues to persist. Now let's take a look at the Rusty. The Russell 2000 had me a little concerned in here. In fact, I'm still concerned about it because you've got this V-shaped recovery or I should call it like a retrace, okay? Notice that it sold off hard and now it's retracing and now it's, it's quite a bit of ways short of its old highs. This is what I call a gatekeeper pattern. But any pattern or any setup doesn't mean anything unless it triggers. So let's put the bow tie moving averages in here. And the bow ties, as you know, you're looking for a crossover. 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. Notice that they're going up here, and the 10's above the 20, and the 20's above the 30. And notice that they rolled over here, and then they crossed over. So it's still a bow tie, although today's action might begin to negate that. You can see they're crossing back up. But I'm only worried about the index. I mean, you're always worried, but you, you only take the signal if you get a trigger. Okay, so let's say a trigger would probably be about right here if you're going to take that signal. Give it a little wiggle room. Notice that it would have triggered you in yesterday if you'd have had that textbook entry. But keeping things a little bit looser, just in case you get a little fake out like yesterday, would have kept you out of, so far, a losing trade. Now, I'm not a big fan of trading ETFs and indices overall, but I'm just showing you the pattern that's here to help you make those decisions when you're looking at the sector and then drilling down to the individual stocks. And ideally, you want the market headed higher, the sector headed higher, the individual stock headed higher. But if the sector is iffy or if the market is iffy and or one of those two, okay, or in 100%, then just have that in the back of your mind, and this is when you're doing that obsession part, when you have that big cup of coffee at the end of the day and watch it, looking at those stocks, say, okay, here's a setup. Do I really, really like this setup? Okay, you should always ask yourself that, no matter what the conditions are, but you really need to ask yourself that when the market's going mostly sideways or stalling short of its old highs, okay? And if you really, really like the setup, then take it. Trading all balls down to making decisions and, more importantly, living with them. I normally make a joke about why it's expense, but be my luck. She'd watch this presentation, <laughs> see what I'm doing here on Thursday. Uh, so anyway, uh, Rusty, I feel a heck of a lot better if it got past its old little high in here. Uh, by the way, this is something I was showing someone a couple days ago, and I just thought everybody did this. I thought like uh, – you know, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. I thought everybody knew that, but um, I was putting up a two-day chart and a telechart. You could do it in other uh, packages too, but if you just hit your two key, you get a two-day chart. And sometimes you get a little bit more clarity when you do that. For instance, like the bow tie is kind of sloppy in here, 
And on a two-day chart, you could see that it was a little bit clearer a few days ago that the market looked like it was rolling over. Now, you don't rush out and short it just because you have the, the pattern of the setup. Again, you wait for an entry. And notice so far it's going straight back up. Just like that stock we showed a minute ago. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, here it is. Uh, just like the stock here, we had a pretty good setup right here. In fact, it was an excellent setup. I was actually excited about it. I'm like, this trades, we not only made money here, we're going to get back in, and, we, and this is going to be the real trend, and we're going to make a lot of money in this position. And what happened? It just kind of came up, went back in, okay? So I recommended buying this stock, but only and only if it entered, if it hit a trigger, okay? No trigger, no trade. So this thing just imploded. So I'm not wrong because it didn't trigger. So you just move on. So just like the market looked like it was going to uh, set up as a or a rollover based on this bow tie, on a two-day bow tie, so far it's going straight back up. And so far it's just shy of all-time highs, okay? Now, I wouldn't get too excited until and unless it gets there and beyond. Because so far, until proven otherwise, draw your lines, draw your sideways arrows or whatever, we're still in this sideways trend. Longer term trend still remains intact. Looking at the 200 day moving average, okay? But shorter term to intermediate term, we're still kind of sideways, okay? One thing I was messing with the other day when I uh, plotted, just an FYI, uh, I plotted the bow ties. And I like to plot the bow ties with the five-day, I'm sorry, the 50-day moving average. This is a simple 50-day moving average. And one thing you look for, and maybe it's a little bit more clear in the NASDAQ, one thing you look for is the angle of inflection. The, the sharper the angle of inflection coming into the 50-day, the more powerful the signal is. Now, again, it has to trigger. NASDAQ's going, going up. Okay, you had the setup was here. NASDAQ went up, went up went up, made a higher low, and then now today it's going up. So this is no longer a signal. Once you get back to close to the old highs, that signal is negated again. No capital put into harm's way by following the sell signal. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, I do like to put that 50-day moving average. And, and what, one thing that I, that I witnessed is if you take a look at like a weekly chart, and I showed this uh, recently, in my column, this is a sell signal, this is a bow tie buy, this is a bow tie sell, this is a bow tie buy. So you could see that you've had some pretty incredible trends out of those weekly bow ties. Now, one thing that I keep noticing over and over again, this is why I love to teach because I learned so much myself. From a selfish standpoint, I, I'm just greedy uh, because I learned so much in the process. But one thing I was noticing, this would be a this is a 50-day moving average on a daily chart. So on a weekly chart, it would be the same as a 250-day moving average, okay? So on a weekly chart, it's, it's, it's 50 days, but it would be the equivalent of a 250-day moving average on a daily chart. So you multiply 50 times five, that's five trading days, that gives you 250 days. So if you wanted to plot this on a daily chart, this moving average here would be the same as a 250-day moving average. And one thing that I noticed, and this is, again, I, I do have a point, believe it or not, is that everything works better with trend. So once a market's trending, you could take a very, very, very simple system and follow it, and you're going to print money as long as the market trends. That's why I think my stuff works so well because it's very simple. And as long as the market, we're not trying to outsmart the market. We're just trying to find a place to get on and stick with the trend. But everything works better with trend. And one thing I was noticing, if you just looked at the slope of the moving average, and if it was turned, if it was down, you were short. And if it was up, you stayed long as long as it pointed up. You'd have some lag. Don't get me wrong. But for the most part, you would have captured some amazing trends longer term in the market. Now, obviously, you need to have stops in place because 
if a market crashes, or I should say when a market crashes, because they will sooner or later, then it's going to take a long time for that long, long-term moving average to catch up. But as a general statement, if a market is trending, you want to stay on the same side of the trend based just simply on the angle of the moving average. So I was making the point that these bow ties are wonderful for keeping you on the right side of the market, even on a weekly basis where there is a lot of lag. But just kind of even simpler is just following an angle, okay, the slope of a longer-term moving average can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. So I just want to throw that out a little fodder uh, for research. And, and, you know, if ever you find yourself, and I've, I've done this for years and years and years, and I no longer do it, but I used to wake up really early and stay at the office really late programming systems. I'm still in here uh, those long hours, maybe even longer. But I'm not wasting my time programming system after system, uh, oscillator after oscillator, and then derivatives of derivatives. I'm more interested in just looking at the charts to see where they're going. Are they going up or they're going down or they're going sideways? And what simple ways can I use to follow those trends? So if you ever get caught up, plot it, uh, caught you, find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or try to figure out, is it a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third? And some of you would know what that means. Uh, stop and look at the trend. I've seen some people use some methods which, which I'm not a big fan of. But when the market is trending, they actually print money. And when they lose money is when the market is not trending and their system, or, or trending the opposite way, their system is telling them that they should be buying a market because this is the end of a certain wave or whatever, um, and the market is heading lower. And it's like they, they're just kind of like ignoring which way this, this system is going. Years ago, I was uh, – I became friendly with a with a really good trader, and every day he would give me this bearish argument, bearish argument, bearish argument. And finally, I'm like, well, so are you short? He's like, no, I'm long. I'm like, well, why are you long? You're so bearish. He goes, because the market is going up. So everything works better with trend and stick with the trend. And I know it's cliche, but that's going to keep you out of a lot. Of trouble. Let's take a look at some of these sectors in here. Uh, it's kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you hate to say hopefully, or use the word hold, but hopefully if this market continues, then uh, a lot of these weaker sectors will come back in here. Take a look at like the semis. Let's try a two-day chart. Yeah, two-day chart to semis. You got a pretty serious bow tie work, and you also, you could argue that it's sort of an inverted cup and handle. A lot of technicals all come together at the same point. You're going to find that a bow tie will often form on the right side of a cup and a handle, okay? Or a gatekeeper short pattern will form on the right side of a head and shoulder. I guess I guess you can't trade off the left side of the chart, so it's redundant for me to talk about the right side of the chart because um, where the patterns form. Uh, and if you do find a broker that will let you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. But you can see when you go to a two-day chart of the semis, it cleans things up a little bit. And you got a first thrust down. you got a little pullback in here. And you also have a very clean bow tie, a very tight. Notice a little tight fulcrum point right here on right at that 50-day moving average at a sharp angle against it. So that's kind of a cool little pattern here. Um, it's cool, but I hope it doesn't work, okay? <laughs> I hope this market goes straight back up. So that's the semis. A little concerning there. Uh, software was looking a little iffy in here, but notice what's happened. It's turned right back up, and it looks like it wants to go back to new highs. Take a look at drugs, recently breaking out nicely to new highs in here. And if they hold today's rally, they'll be at brand new highs. Uh, nice little base that they came off of. So this could be the real deal. This could be a blow-off move, but so what? You could get a really nice move once you get a really nice base like this. So yes, if the S&Ps, big if, but if the S&Ps take off, you've got a really nice base that they're launching off of. This could be fantastic. Uh, but Dave, you were, you were a little concerned last week. Yeah, I was really concerned because we were at the bottom of that base. And if we broke down, it's just the opposite. you got all those people that bought in the base looking to bail out. Okay. So the bigger the base, the further the launch in the space. Biotechnology is really doing well in here. It was a little iffy for a while and a little sideways, but now it's beginning to break out. We've been long some biotechs for a long, long time. We got knocked out of a few of them, 
but we still have a couple on. And now the market, the sector, I should say, more specifically, is making new highs in here. So hopefully, and there's that word again, but hopefully we're going to get paid nicely for staying along those biotech stocks. Uh, health services kind of rolled over a little bit, but they've come back. They're just shy of the old highs in here. Uh, for the most part, as you can see, longer term trends still intact there. Retail, retail just was down here sideways, looking ugly, looking sideways, and then it just decided to turn right back up, and now we're banging out new highs at retail. So that's looking pretty darn good. Transports, eh, not so good, okay? Big blue arrow still points down there. Retrace a little bit higher, but for the most part, still looking pretty ugly. And then if you take a look at like a three-day chart, it begins to get a little bit clearer in here. Your bow tie begins to form a little bit more clearly. And it looks like they're in a lot of trouble, okay? Now, I don't follow the Dow theory, which says that the transports go down, so will the market. And they may be right this time. But so far, the market looks like it wants to go back to make new highs. So we're going to continue to follow the longer-term trend in the overall market. But make a footnote, Okay. Eh, transport's not looking too good. Semiconductor's not looking too good. So there's always something to worry about. There are some negatives out there, but I wouldn't try to take any one market and use it to predict another market. They call it intermarket technical analysis. And do read the books on it, uh, specifically read Murphy's book, Intermarket Technical Analysis of Financial Markets, or what is it called? Let me see if I can find it here in my um, bookcase. Anyway, I think it's called Intermarket Technical Analysis, but read that book, and, and as I preach almost every week, even Murphy himself, who wrote the book on it, literally wrote the book on Intermarket Technical Analysis, will tell you that there's long lead and lag cycle. So even if there is some sort of correlation, you can't really time one market off the other. Uh, I've been around a block a time or two, and I spent about 15 years at a hedge fund that traded uh, bonds, uh, specifically bond options. And... Early in my career, I noticed that there was a, a definite, uh, uh, often quite inverse correlation between stocks and bonds. But as the years progresses, progress, progresses, progressed, I learned also that there was a serious decoupling. And it seems like those markets are, are really decoupled now. And it only matters when it matters. We'll take a look at bonds in just one second. Uh, so you can't necessarily trade one market off the other. I posted at a forum a few years ago. I posted some, uh, somebody was looking for an S&P system. I'm like, well, I, I don't personally do it, but I know some people that trade uh, bow ties on five minute charts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, so check this out. Here's a, here's a free little system you might want to take a look at, you know, and some guy came back and, uh, said, no, no, no. All you do is you watch the dollar. If the dollar goes up, you buy the peas or vice versa. I forget what it was. And I'm thinking, like, that's cool, but that's going to work until it don't. I even have a book here somewhere. I have to dig it out. It's about someone who used to trade stocks off of bonds. And uh, I'm sure he's adjusted his system. He's a famous trader. But that no longer works. So you got to realize that you can't really trade one market off the other. But it does pay to pay attention. Before I forget, let's take a look at bonds. So bonds down, stocks up, right? Or I'm sorry, vice versa. Bonds down, bonds down, stocks down. Yeah. See, I'm getting confused. We'll, we'll plot them in here. Uh, the absolute level of interest rates, which are reflected by the price of bonds, bonds down, obviously rates go up, right? Because it's, it's that that is a definite inverse correlation. The absolute level of interest rates really isn't that important. I seem to remember that when the interest rates were 9%, that the stock market was doing pretty darn good. And it was because that the perceived level of interest rates was coming down. So you want to have your money in stocks as opposed into um, in, into bonds. It's the change of rates that makes a big deal. But if you look at bonds here, they've gone mostly sideways for quite a while. So that's kind of a little bit of relief. We did kind of skirt the bottom here recently, about a week ago. But so far, we bounced off of it, and so far, so good. So as long as rates can stabilize and not make that big delta, that big change, okay, then I think that the market can adjust to the slightly higher rates. Because the rates are so darn low, it doesn't really matter if they go up a tick or two, okay, the rates themselves. 
the absolute level of rates doesn't matter. But if it's perceived that we're going to have this big old change in interest rates, then everybody's going to run for the door at the same time. Okay. P P P Y P L V. The guy who screams on TV likes it. Oh, geez. <laughs> Marty Schwartz, Pitbull. Yeah, I don't want to pick on Marty, uh, but it seems like, uh, you know, I read that book after the fact. I mean, like after the fact, meaning that it was it was many years after it was written. And uh, I found myself thinking that, hey, that doesn't work anymore, this bond stocks thing. OK. But it did back when he was doing it. So that's OK. As long as something's working, stick with it. You know, I don't want to digress too far, but but I'm, I'm a host of this weekly show for Timing Research, and I just I was invited as a guest about six, eight months ago. And, um, you know, I was kind of all jazzed about the show. And after the show, he's like, hey, you want to be my guest host? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Because uh, it's I'm, I guess I'm a, I'm a ham. You know, I, I enjoy doing this. And what's cool about the show is we have other experts on and I really enjoy the interaction with the other experts and all. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, anyway, where I'm going with this is that we, they ask a question of the week. And one of the questions is like, um, you know, what, what methods have you found profitable or whatever? And, and some guy kind of just like the guy who's trading the E-minis off the dollar, you know, the church of what's happening now said, oh, you just trade spreads and he's making the, he's printing money, trading spreads. Well, That'll work until it don't. This market has gone sideways for eight months, okay? And it's had decent volatility during that period. Let's take a look at the piece, okay? So if you're selling spreads, you're going to make a decent amount of money. The problem is when you end up with a market that does this, like back way back October, okay, you're going to lose all that money and then some. And if you can recover, if you don't get wiped out, it's going to be really hard to recover from that. So if you are trading a specific, it's kind of like the three blind guys on the elephant. You know, the snake is the trunk, the tail is a rope, and um, the feet, the legs, I guess, are like a tree. It depends on your perspective. And that's kind of like the, the market changes. It's not any one of those things for a long, long time. And people tend to get a little too caught up in that people think that you could buy and hold but buy and hold simply doesn't work you get a year like 2007 2008 where the market loses half of its value and if you're buying and holding and you're getting ready to retire <laughs> and you you know it's middle of 2008 or 2009 or early 2009 you're thinking about recovering retire you're a hurt and pop and that can make a big difference on your uh on your lifestyle so just keep in mind that conditions change. Okay, I'm um, I'm digressing a little bit here. So let's uh, let's get into the markets. Uh, Martin says it's nice that you're teaching out of a negative example, a failed trade. Well, it's not a failed trade. Uh, it's it's a good example. I mean, if this is the worst I ever did on a trade, uh, I'd be pretty happy. Okay, so but yeah, I do like the I do. I did kind of cherry pick this one in that it didn't turn into the mother of all trades because it's real easy to cherry pick of that, that to just go on forever. But I thought it was kind of cool that this is the ultimate goal. This is what I teach and preach is that just catching this longer term trend up here. And this one did, but so what you made, you made this much and then you made this much, you made zero. Okay. So, this plus this, this is 1% on the total portfolio plus zero. That's better than a poke in the eye, okay? I'll take that any day of the week. Now, obviously, longer term, you have to do much better than this because of your losses. But if you scratch out of a trade after making 1% on it, then pat yourself on the back and then go off and look for some more opportunities, okay? I think people always learn from failed trades than from successful ones. It's my experience that that's nice to show one successful trade and then two failed ones to get people ready for trading. Good job, Dave. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I should probably, you know, here's the thing with a with losing trade. Every night I'll show a loser. Um, but there's really not much to show. Okay, let's say that, let's say we had the entry down here and we did trigger in this trade. And let's say we had the stop like right here. Okay, 
Well, there's nothing to show. It's like, oh, hey, look, we got in here. Stop that here. That's to be. And here's here's a little secret here. Your losses need to be passive. You have to let the market margin call. How many times do I have to tell you every Thursday at 11 o'clock I do a show? <laughs> but your losses need to be passive. So, um, yeah, you, there will be losses. I probably preach too much about the fact that there will be losses. It scares a lot of people away. I'd probably make a lot more money on my educational business if I just told everybody that uh, there will be eternal sunshine. But – for a losing trade, again, it's a passive, it's a passive thing. It's a passive decision. It's not an active one, okay? But on the management of a winning trade, there is some active management that has to happen. And that's why I talk a lot about the winning trades. But like life, you tend to learn more from your mistakes than your success and if you're not le learning from your mistakes then you might as well just hang it up then then you know <laughs> hey dave i saw your weekly picture from the s p what do you think about the length of this bull market well a lot of people are talking about that um and we we'll take a look at that real quick let's take a look at like a there's a weekly chart we take a look at the monthly if you want. And you can see this is a pretty long bull market, okay? And some people are saying that, well, it's going long enough. Well, the problem with that is it could always go longer. So, yeah, I'm less excited about this market than I was back in 2009. Because in 2000 it died, everything was just kind of sold out, and then we started to rally, and we started putting up positions, and then it long work, another long work, another long work, our, starts, our shorts stopped out. And it's like, okay, we could be at the beginning of something new. But you could still have a pretty long trend in a market. In fact, I mean, look at the longer term trend. I'm just, again, I always learn something from these shows. Let's go back to... 1982 okay so from 1982 till when was that 2000 uh, I think it was March of 2000 right so you had what's that 18 years so you had an 18 year leg that's a pretty good leg 18 years <laughs> so yeah we're a little long in the tooth on this bull market but so what? I mean, it's 2006 years in. So, yeah, you're right. We might only have 12 more years of bull market. Okay. So what? But no, I agree with you. I, I fully understand where you're coming from. I'm not, I'm not giving you a hard time. What I'm saying is that, yeah, it's a little long in the tooth. Yeah, we've been going up for a long time. Maybe it is time to go down. But as long as we can keep banging out new highs, let's not overthink it too much. Okay. And then on each individual trade treat each individual trade as an independent event and not try to factor in too much of this again too many choices analysis paralysis into each individual trade and just ride that trend out in that trade until stopped out but yeah good um, good eye on that a little long in the tooth but so what the guy who screams on TV likes it, PYPLV. This is PayPal when issued. All right, let's take a look at that, PYPLV. Well, so far it's going up, so I can't argue with him. A little bit stalling out in here. Uh, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but my only concern with uh, with PayPal would be that um, it's, it's the most popular – I think it's the most popular payment method in the world. And in the United States, I forget how many millions of people use it, but it's so substantial. It's almost like everybody uses it, okay? So it's like who's left to start using it? Now, again, we're technical analysts, so we don't care. 
So what's happening so far, it's going up, but it really hasn't taken out its, its first week of trading by that much just yet. So I wouldn't rush out and buy this particular stock. Now, if this was at lower levels, those of you who have the IPO course know that there are some little simple breakout things that we use. And by those metrics, this would be a setup and a trigger, uh, depending on today's close, I think. Actually, it's already it would already be long. You'd already be long this particular stock. However, uh, because it's higher price, we tend to get less excited about those signals and wait for what I call a secondary signal. The pioneer signal is uh, back when a when a, a company first comes public after about five days. So we're still kind of in that pioneer phase. And a secondary signal would be if it rallies up and follows through. Then we look to play that first pullback. If all you ever did in IPOs was trade that first pullback, I think you would do just fine. But you would do even better if you paid attention to some of these pioneer signals. But in this particular case, I'm not as excited about the pioneer signals, mostly because the stock came public at a higher level. It seems like if they come public at lower prices, then they tend to work a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, ES, ETSY, and this is one point that I often make when I talk about IPOs, is that this is like the poster child for that. You don't want to rush out and buy an IPO when they first come out. or before, You don't want to try to get them back here, right? Because you're going to get – it won't let me draw back here. But you, won't let, you, won't, you don't want to get them before they come public because this is what could happen. You only know what can happen – once they come public. Now, in this particular case, I would prefer if it made like a longer base in here. But I have to admit, I've been kind of looking at this one, and it's been on my watch list for a few days. But then I'm having a hard time getting excited about it just because it's got some bad memories in here. I prefer if this was like a little further out in time, and then you still have this gap here. So if it could rally up maybe a little bit more, close this gap for back here then I might be forced to consider it. Let's see, we don't have bow ties on it yet, but uh, it's getting there. So yeah, I hear you, and I think uh, I wanna tell you a good eye on that one. It is kind of bottoming out. It might be worth a uh, while. Joe's been waiting patiently for me to talk about Netflix. Netflix is breaking out to all time highs. I find Netflix kind of hard to trade, and it's hard to trade, at least in more recent years, because it trades in chunks, okay? And by that, I mean it's probably earnings, I guess, setting it, around, uh, setting it up and down. But look, it just imploded back here. Boom, okay? And then it just took off right here. And then it took off here, you know? So it's kind of all over the place and hard to trade. But, yeah, maybe if it follows through to the upside on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. Now, the only other caveat is the volatility is pretty low on this. It's got an HV of 24. This is the 50-day historical volatility if you need the formula i can give it to you or you can just google it get it off the internet that's what i did to uh, program some of this stuff in also notice that the volume is just ridiculously high and i don't know if i have enough digits on here but i think it's 27 million a day or it's it's in the millions and millions and millions what's this four one two three uh so far today it's traded like 40 million shares is that right one, two, three. It's hard. It's changes. It's hard to see. Yeah, 40 million. 40, it's going to be 41 million shares. So you have a lot of people kind of fighting it out. It's a very efficient stock now, uh, even though today, obviously, it's making an inefficient move. I, I would just leave it alone. I would much rather ferret out like a, a smaller cap stock within reason that has potential to make a really nice move. Okay. VA looks like a triple base. Bow tie is close to my trigger. What do you think? Yeah, VA is looking pretty good. Um, I'm not, you know, here's here's the problem, and, and, and I've got to be careful not to confuse the issue with facts, but I'm having a hard time getting excited about an airline, okay? And when you look at an IPO, as I said in the, in the IPO course, I said, what's the story, fat or glory? Now, one time... Uh, my classic example was uh, Lulamon, L-U-L-U, -L -U, was set up perfectly. It was a beautiful setup. 
and I laughed at it, and I put it. I, I mentioned it in my trading service. I put it in the Landry list, but I didn't put it as official recommendation. And I said they make yoga clothes, and I'm like, I remember that that particular time when I was doing my recording, I rolled my eyes and laughed. Okay, and then I watched the stock go up 40, 50 percent over the next three, four, five days. And boy, was I bummed out. That's one of the biggest uh, missed trades of my career. It was really pissed me off that I confuse the issue with facts. So it doesn't necessarily have, they don't necessarily have to be splitting the atom or curing a boli or whatever. Sometimes if they can just make good burritos or uh, maybe exercise clothes for, for guys like Big Dave who eat too many burritos. But with an airline, uh, it's, my, my favorite trading system for airlines is, we're short UAL, by the way. UAL, I think that's, yeah, UAL. My favorite system for airlines is wait for them to go up and then just sell them. <laughs> I don't have to joke about that. But I have to admit, and boy, it's hard. I'm just, I just, ha I got to practice what I preach, right? This is why I teach, because it makes me practice what I preach. Look at that. You're going to have a bow tie here soon. you got a nice little base. This is what I call the uh, baby comeback. You get a, an IPO that stalls out, bottoms out, and then starts to rally again. So, yes, if this rallies up a little bit on a first little pullback, this could be a worthwhile trade. And then if it comes back into this base, you have to get out. Okay. I used the pullback yesterday for a small position. Yeah, I tend to trade. I'm all in on a trade. And that's why I'm so picky. And a lot of people, sometimes I get on a, a weekly webcast with some other people, get invited on. And they're like, man, you're so picky. And it's like, well, I am because I want to be in that trade for a long, long time. So I'm not going to go in and take a little piece of the trade. The problem is if you're not consistent, if you don't trade consistently, meaning that if you vary your position size, you're going to get into a position with a very small piece. And that one's going to take off. And then on some other one, you think, OK, well, let me go in with 100 percent. And what happens? It becomes a losing trade. So you got a big winner. But you've got so little profit on a big winner, it's not going to take care of that losing trade. So I'm not a big fan of scaling into positions. And, and this that's a conversation for another day. It's taking more than the remaining time to explain that. And it might bore a few of you guys. But, yeah, you want to be consistent in your position size. So I would encourage you to uh, reach a size, uh, reach a position size where you stay with it. Nice. And in a few days and then stop out of Kang. Okay. I did have access to the internet for a few days and didn't stop out of Kang. Now that's pulling back up. Would it be advisable to see what it does or should I bail out? I am long from 2130. All right. Let's take a look at that. Okay. Uh, yeah. See, this is this was a, a, a stock on the service. And uh, there's your there's your losing example. Uh, and it stopped out. Um, see, this is where additional decisions start kind of messing with your head and messing things up. So the original plan was to get stopped out. I mean, it, not, no, take that back. The original plan was to make money. But the original plan had a stop in it. And if you're stopped, you're stopped, okay? So it did stop out. So this is where it gets kind of tricky because now it's going back up. So what do you do? Well, I would put a stop in at some level and let the market take you out. Um, if you could, if you could take it off your screen and never look at it again, then exit at the market and forget about it. Okay, and promise yourself you're never going to pull the stock up again. Okay, unless you're looking through your charts and you see it set up again, then you might reconsider it. But you're not going to obsess over it now that you're you've you've had a losing trade. The other al the other alternative to that would be to put in a hard stop at some level below the market and let it take you out. But realize that, and this is where, this is where psychologically we could be creating a little bit of a monster because what if this thing comes roaring back and you make a lot of money on this trade? Well, the market just taught you to not honor your stop. So if you do, if this does come back and you do stay with it, just know that, Okay, I made money on this trade, but I did not do what I was supposed to do. 
So I can't reward myself for this trade, but yeah, it worked out. That's fine. So you can see how by not following the plan, the decision process begins to unravel a little bit. And then all of a sudden you're created, you're creating more and more decisions and creating more and more stress. And then you're, you're becoming obsessed. I'm not saying that you personally, but you will become obsessed with looking at this position, trying to make a decision, trying to make a decision, analysis paralysis. And guess what's going to happen? Zoom, zoom, zoom. Three or four great looking trades are going to go by you and you're not going to catch them because you're focused on this one position here. I think I wrote in Dave Landry on swing trading. There was a, a, a guy I was friendly with, um, broker friend. And he, uh, I asked him how he was doing. I said, market's trending. He goes, yeah, market's looking great. I said, well, how are you doing? He said, ah, I'm not doing so hot. Uh, I, I said, you took, you take this position, that position. No, I didn't take those. Well, why didn't you take it? Because I'm busy nursing some positions, some, some bad positions. Like, why are you focused on your bad positions when there's all these good stocks that you could be trading? Like, like one time I said, I think I also said that in Dave Landry on swing trading when I walked into the gym. The little receptionist is like, uh, what's wrong with you? I guess it was, you could read my face. I am kind of an emotional creature, I guess like everybody else on earth, but I, mean, I tend to be emotional. Um, I was like, ah, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. And she's like, well, sell them and buy some good ones. And it's like, you know, I kind of growled at her, but it's, you know, she's right. Okay. But the caveat is if your stocks aren't performing, and you're following your plan, then continue to follow your plan. But if a stock or your stocks got away from you and you should have been stopped out, then that's a different situation. Okay. The point is that you could you could waste a lot of mental energy, which you're going to need for other purposes, if you're not following your plan. Fold. Yeah, fold looks pretty good as far as a, a stock that's trending. Uh, it has to pull back, though. So on a pullback, yeah, absolutely, that could uh, be a pretty good trade, provided it doesn't, doesn't, of course, pull all the way back to 4T where it broke out from. But, yeah, so far so good. Good eye on that one, Don. About time. We finally got Don in a, in a, in a trending stock, Ford. Well, Ford's trending lower. <laughs> to those of you who knew the show, Don shows up every week and asks about Ford. Uh, yeah, it's still in a downtrend. There's no trade there for me, though. It's a big, thick stock. Look at your HV. It's only 17, okay? Stock uh, like uh, NVRO, it's one more long. It's got an HV of 50, okay? So it's like three times the HV on that one. All right, let's take a look at uh, RDS for David. RDS. Oh, RDS. It's not coming up. You have another, uh, you have another, another symbol, David? Don, let's look at Apple. Apple recently looked like it could be in trouble. It's coming back. A couple things about Apple. First of all, Apple kind of trades like a cult stock. There's like a cult. It's kind of hard to explain. It's like it just it doesn't trade like a normal stock. It's a cult stock, the cult of Apple. Everybody's like all into Apple. And it makes it difficult to trade. And now that it's it's so thick, I think it's even in the Dow now. Yeah, it's in the Dow, right? Um, it's just become too big to even consider trading. And notice that your HV is only 18. What's the market right now? Let's take a look at the spiders. They're about 11. Yeah, look at that, 11. So it's it, it doesn't move around much more than the overall market. And my... Mantra is you can't beat a market with stocks that move around less than the overall market. I like more volatile stocks within reason. Okay. And I think I have some articles on my website on that. So it's a base. It's sideways. It's pulled back to its base. Let's draw the couple days ago. It was kind of set up. It does still look like it could roll over in here. But again, you need a trigger. So if it dropped below, let's say, one... What is this right here? If it took out last Thursday, Friday's low, 713. When was that? Three days ago. If it takes out the 713 low, then it would be a short. I'm not too excited about taking it. 
just because it's lower in volatility. It, you know, we'll see what happens. But for now, I wouldn't be too excited about taking it. And now you've pushed back into this base. So there's nothing for me there, just based on the sideways arrow for now. Okay, with positive results for the banks, what's your outlook for the sector? Banks have been doing pretty good as of late. They've came back, but they're kind of all over the place. And let's see if I can find them in here. Let's take a look at the banks. Here we go. The banks were rolling over about a week ago, and then they went straight back up. But they're kind of choppy, as you can see there. You draw a sideways line. You see they haven't gone anywhere in a while. So, but yeah, they're going back up. Um, I think I'd be more excited about a smaller bank. And um, he's asking about uh, BAC, JPM, and GS. Let's take a look at those. Well, BAC is just kind of going straight up in here. Look at the volume in here. It's just tremendous volume. So it's a little too, th what I would call, thick to trade. And it doesn't move around a whole lot, okay? HV is only 19. And let's see what the... That's like a 12% move over like two or three years in here. It's been in a, 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 like a 10, 12% range. It only moves around a point or two. So I would much rather be in a stock that moves a point or two in one afternoon than a point or two over six to eight months. So it's not something I get too excited about. But yeah, I hear you. It is breaking out. Maybe if it breaks out, it keeps on going. It might be worth a shot. Okay. And then what's the other one? Uh, JPM and GS. JPM. Now, Jay, this looks pretty good. Again, though, it's lower in volatility. It looks 60 to – this is only about a five-point run or eh, about eight-point run maybe. And I'd rather be in a stock that runs up eight points over a couple of weeks than eight points over six or seven months or whatever it is. But, yeah, it's making new highs. You can't argue with success. If it keeps making new highs, then on a pullback – it might be worth a shot. And then what's the other one, GS? These are stocks that I really don't uh, get that interested in trading. Now, GS is a little bit different in that. Notice that it's already stalled short of its prior highs in here. And again, look at the HV. It's only 15. The overall market's what, 11? What's the NASDAQ? Anybody know? Let's see. Oh, I don't have it plotted for some reason. Anybody know what the NASDAQ is right now? Let's... I don't know if the Q's will give us a true representation. Q's of 14. And look at that Q's breaking out to all-time highs. Yay. That's good. Jay's wants to know about Jack. J-A-K-K. Um, I think this stock looks like it's had a little bit of trouble in here. It's kind of a knockout, but a knockout to extreme. Um, longer term, kind of wide and loose. Shorter term, I see what you're seeing. Uh, maybe after it would have been a buy like right here. That's like a big trend knockout. But when you get a wide range bar down in a trend knockout like this, and it doesn't trigger over the next few days, then the stock truly might be in trouble. So I would, I would leave it alone. I mean, this stock would have to go on and make new highs and then pull back again before I get excited about it. Uh, if anything, it might be in trouble, but I don't think we should be shorting this market right now. S bucks. I'm not a big fan of S bucks because of the uh, it's such a thick stock and look at the volatility. It's a, uh, it's only a HV of uh, 16 and you know, it was 50 and then it took it what three or four months to go up to 54. So it doesn't move enough for me. And here's the problem too. Something bad could always happen. And I've done plenty of presentations on this, but if you go in and look at uh, poke around the week of charts on YouTube, you'll see that. I often talk about how it's better the devil you know. In fact, I've got a, if you go to my website under um, free reports, and right now, if you go here into products, there I have a report on why you want to be trading more volatile stocks. I would encourage you to look right here, free reports, and then this is the one you want. It's going to be about, um, this is an article I just wrote for, Traders Magazine, and right here, you want to read this one, why you should trade more efficient markets, and then keep an eye out. I just did, uh, the one I'm looking for is not up here yet, but it'll be here soon, but uh, go with this one first, and then the other one is going to be 
better the devil you know, where you, you're better off trading more volatile stocks. So I thought it was up there. It's not up there yet, but I'll put it up there uh, first chance. Somebody remind me. Uh, RCD wants to know about Fit. Fit looked uh, pretty good as of, as your first little pullback in here, okay? And then now it's rocketed higher, obviously. Uh, on a pullback, absolutely. That looks pretty good. So good eye on that, but on a pullback. And you can see we've got that first little pullback of the IPO pattern back here we are talking about a few minutes ago. This is actually a pattern I call a flag pole where it shoots up and comes right back in. And it's also your first deep retracement, another one of those IPO patterns. So, yeah, good eye on that one, but on a pullback. Refiners could be an example breaking out, but report earnings into June, July. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not worried about earnings um, because I think if you worry about earnings, then you got to worry about Greece, then you got to worry about China, then you got to worry about the situation in Nigeria. And before you know it, you end up with that, that aforementioned analysis paralysis. But Dave, won't you get whacked on earnings? Yeah, every now and you every now and you will, but you also might catch good earnings, and you should catch good earnings if you are trading in the direction of the trend. Because as a general statement, but I can't guarantee it, but as a general statement, surprises do tend to happen in the direction of the trend. Uh, Dave, I'm long. ICPT looks like a W now. Could break out. ICPT, ICPT. We're gonna have to go to a lightning round. No, see, this is not a stock I'd want to trade because it's going sideways. I mean, if if you're long, stay long because so far so good. But this isn't something that I'd get excited about. Now, it could bow tie it here, but I'm more excited about a bow tie like this coming off a of multi-year lows than I am one like this coming off a of mid-level. So I would I would pass on that as far as a new trade. RDSA, I'm not familiar with this one. Uh, it's not coming up, David. RDSA, uh, give me the stock name. We'll look it up. RCD wants to know about Supnin. S-U-P-N. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. Looks good. Uh, fantastic. You've got a nice little breakout here. Uh, provided it follows through. Let's say it follows through 20-something, and then on the pullback, absolutely. Keep that on your momentum list. Uh, we could, I'm not a big fan of refiners. Um they don't tend to trend too much. Am, am I thinking of the right one? Somebody's asking about the refiners. Let's see. Uh, in the energies. Let's take a look at that real quick. I said we'd go to lightning round. Here we go. Uh, refiners right there. Um, they just kind of chop around. They're kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, commodity stocks in general, commodity related stocks tend to chop around. And refiners are kind of tricky because refiners actually do better with lower energy prices than higher energy prices. Um, the energy still remained a downtrend overall, but you can see that they are kind of scraping bottom in here. I wouldn't buy them, but wait until you get a bow tie up. Wait until you get a big rally off of lows and then look to trade pullback. Steve wants to know about SGEN. Hey, Karen, you're next. Uh, well, it's already kind of triggered somewhat of a pullback, maybe on subsequent pullbacks. It's a little wide and loose longer term, but, uh, yeah, if it keeps rallying on a pullback, possibly. Karen wants to know about VLO. That's a marketer and a refiner. Valero. Yeah, the volatility is a little low. It is breaking out sort of the new highs. It would have to follow through and then pull back for me to get excited, but it's probably something that I wouldn't trade. But, hey, you know, a lot of new people today, and I appreciate you coming to the show. Um, you know, it's not my way or highway. I'm just kind of telling you as far as um, I see things. Uh, no, I wouldn't trade this one. It's a REIT. Look at the volatility. is super low on this. It's only got a volatility of 12. Uh, you know, this is, what, 45 to 40. It took it like six months to go down, five points percentage-wise. That's not that much. It's not worth trading. Okay. Got you, Karen. No problem. Okay, in regards, to regards, in regards to earnings season, would you take a really good-looking setup slash entry? Yes. If it triggers a few days or a week before it reports, yes. Seems like a market traps a lot of people with false moves. Well, it could. But if you're, if, if you know, I believe in keeping it simple, making as few decisions as possible, few choices as possible. 
So don't worry about it. And yeah, you're gonna get whacked sooner or later. But there's always something out there that could that could that could whack a stock. But yeah, it's it's one of those things. Um, and just be ready for it. I thought a full position went 30 breaks. Okay, you're talking about uh, the one we talked about earlier. That's fine. 41 million shares over over half a billion in dollars. Oh, okay. Phil says at 41 million shares, that's a half a billion in dollars. So a half a billion uh, uh, dollars today. Show a short you like. Uh, I have a couple in the service today, but I'm not recommend. Uh, you know what? I'll show you one. And I'm not recommending you rush out and short this because I'm su suggesting that you don't short. But this is THRM. This was in my Landry. Usually I don't mention my Landry list in, in the show. But since we're not, since I recommended not taking the setup, I, I could show it. you got a bow tie down off of all-time highs. It's pulled back a little bit, and now it's beginning to trigger. But the volume is really thin, so be careful on that one. In fact, I wouldn't even take it. I would not take it. Uh, it's also probably going to be hard to borrow. But, yeah, look at that. That stock looks like it's had a lot of trouble. So that's a short that I would like, uh, Joe. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Uh, read the Go Go Nomo strategy on that uh, free reports page. And you'll see some uh, things uh, about some shorts that I like. Okay, rare. Did we talk about that one? We're a little over time. Yeah, absolutely. Put this on. This is on my momentum list in here. Uh, I want to pull back. Absolutely. That looks fantastic. Good eye on that one. MBLY. And yeah, on a pullback. That's definitely, uh, that needs to go on your momentum list. If it's not already on it, put that on your watch list. XIV is a short. Ah, uh, I would, I would, I would run. Don't walk. Anything VIX related, ETF, ETN, stay, stay as far away from that as you can. Uh, too, not enough time to get into it today. You're welcome, Joe. And yeah, look at those other ones on that uh, Go Go Nomo. That's a shorty strategy. Okay, last one, AFMD. Yeah, on a pullback. I mean, that needs to be on your. Uh, that needs to definitely be on your momentum list. A little bit thin, but that's okay for the long side. You can definitely go after it. Well, look, we ran late today. I, I have a blast doing these shows. Thanks for all the new guys and girls that showed up today. I really appreciate you taking time. You scheduled to be here. Uh, we have a lot of fun with these shows. I try not to take myself too seriously. So I uh, hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that, um, if I didn't like your stock, it's nothing personal. I just have a very particular way of, uh, the way I like to pick stocks and they need to be clean and, and a certain volatility and all these other things that I preach out, preach about in these uh, shows and on my website. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. Thanks again to everybody for showing up. Any unanswered questions, I answer all my emails. I guess I should put the caveat in there eventually. So send me an email at davidalander.com, and I'll be happy to get to it. If it requires a little bit more thought and a little bit more work to answer, then it'll become fodder for next week's show. Uh, if I don't talk to you guys and girls by the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you so much.